Hello, every folks, and welcome to some context. All right, so here's the deal. Um, when it comes to Reborn, um, there's a lot of misunderstandings, as is, you know, kind of the norm for the series, quite frankly, uh, when it comes to uh, the post-game, um, and, and, well, basically just the game balance in general. There's constantly the uh, the argument back and forth on every forum that I've seen on this, of like, oh, you know, XYZ thing is overpowered or underpowered or useless or unstoppable. And let me tell you right now, you know why that is? You know why nobody can agree on what's, uh, you know, what's the best or what's the worst aside from maybe summons under certain circumstances? Well, it all comes down to the fact that all of it is entirely balanced in a circle. It kind of always has been to a degree. Uh, we didn't see this as much in the PSP version because, well, obviously stuff like uh, longbows ended up sticking out pretty, uh, uh, pretty sharply. And even then, you know, you had plenty of arguments for a bunch of ways that they were potentially, uh, you know, worse than other options. And it's actually especially hilarious to consider that longbows were one of the worst options uh, when it came to the uh, uh, multiplayer in that game. But uh, anyway, anyway, so uh, let's kind of uh, get into the hows and whys of all this stuff, though. So, like, right here, okay? Uh, you might notice I've got a guy uh, that is, you know, while technically max level in the post-game and whatever else, we've got a very weird loadout of different characters doing particular things here, um, and it might not exactly mesh with kind of what's considered the meta here. So... Here's the deal. Everything is entirely contextual, okay? The, the only reason that at certain points you might have had those moments of like, oh, wow, I'm sure glad I trained them as, you know, XYZ class, you know, before training, uh, going and switching them to this other thing, or, you know, wow, I can't believe, you know, how good XYZ thing, is, you know, is against uh, these guys right here. I'm sure glad I switched over to this one weapon. Nine times out of ten, it's just going to come down to the fact that you had some particular advantage against those particular units. Like, for example, um, in this particular case, if somebody happened to come in with a bunch of ice units, they would be doing a whole lot more because this particular uh, map is covered entirely in air units. Almost, well, almost entirely in air, in, uh, air units. Um, whereas, for example, you might notice right here there is a archer uh, that is uh, that's an air element himself. But he's running a roughly chapter four bow, with the uh, with the main selling point of that bow being that he can guarantee a charm with it. Oh. Meanwhile, this archer over here is running another bow that is uh, well, literally from frickin' heaven. Um, that uh, they have a, a heaven general bow that's basically going to be one of the strongest hitting options in the game. Uh, you might notice uh, when it comes to finishers, they practically do the same damage though. So does that mean all of it is meaningless, or what exactly is going on there? Well. Again, everything is entirely circumstantial. That's the thing. There is no one direct answer. There's never a situation where there's only one problem at play. Um, everything is going to have multiple factors. Like, so, for example, say that guy is shooting that unit over there. Their particular elements are taken into consideration. The uh, unit's armor, uh, and depending on how much it can resist of his particular shot, is taken into consideration. On top of that, the skills of the relevant units are then taken into consideration. Um... And in some t in some cases, uh, the actual element of that particular map is taken into consideration. Um, and, for example, in uh, certain other circumstances, it might just be down to buffs or whatever else. So any number that you see is that number in that circumstance and may have absolutely no bearing on absolutely anything else whatsoever. So, for example, I oftentimes see the argument of, you know, oh, shamans go burr, haha, they kill everything. It's so good how big their number is. I am so impressed at the girth of their digits. And... Okay, all well and good, but here's the thing. In context, it may be weird to see that, uh, well, the argument can be made that they kind of suck. Now, how does that exactly work, right? So, let's take a look at what shamans even are. They're essentially a Chapter 4 class uh, that you end up uh, getting that is more or less min-maxed for DPS, right? Um, so, for example, if you give them something like Nature Power, which they get in the post-game, um, as, which uh, will give you a slight boost to your uh, next elemental attack, which I have to say, nature power is really, really nerfed in this version. Um, like, I, I feel like it feels more like 5% rather than 50%. I don't know where uh, where exactly all that bonus is going because I've noticed next to no difference from getting rid of it. Um, anyway, so point being, overall, like, let's say in the post game, once you're more or less maxed out, obviously the numbers can go up a bit more, let's say roughly due to rubber banding and whatever else you're gonna be hitting somewhere about 150 to 200 with your summons but hey what about the tier 2 summons they break everything um i mean they hit more 
they don't necessarily break everything, and it may be weird, again, to see that circumstance where they are not necessarily breaking everything. What the hell does that mean now? Well, for example, uh, let's say we take a look at those tier 1 summons, and sometimes you need to target something in a smaller area. They are more or less going to be doing the same damage. They are roughly equivalent, uh, the summons, I mean, uh, to a situation where you are firing multiple missile spells on one unit, uh, like basic missile spells, give or take, right? So the uh, the basic summons are roughly going to be about three to four hits, uh, usually four uh, at this point in the game. I believe it actually might scale off of your um, uh, off of your skill. It's unclear to be completely blunt, but anyway. Uh, point being that, uh, roughly speaking, you're going to be seeing about three to four hits with that, and then the tier twos cost almost uh, double the MP, but they uh, they'll come in with the ability to hit roughly six or seven times. So you know. It, you're essentially doing the usual of burning away efficiency in order to hit much harder on a particular target, which is good. You know, that by itself, fairly solid. But what else does the Shaman do? Well, um, they can tell the weather. That, that's that's nice. Um, this is actually my third Sherry at this point. Uh, the, uh, the Sherries that I have, uh, well, they, they tend to die pretty quick. They don't really have a whole lot in the way of defensive options. They never really have. Um, like, I like putting Resonance on there just because it makes other stuff hit harder. But, like, let's say, for example, let's go ahead and compare some numbers, which I have to say it's particularly funny that they have concentration, and aside from use items, they don't really get the ability to use debuffs, so that's... yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, this would be a fairly standard loadout. You got Meditate to have the MPs, you got the spell books for your penetration, you got Engulf for that range, and then you got the Nature's Touch for the DPS. So, um, testing has been done pretty extensively on this, and realistically, uh, for casters, whether you're going offensive or defensive, entirely just comes down to a couple factors. If you try to give them their matching wand, it does not matter this time around. So you just give them the thing that gives them a big int boost, but you always have the staff in your main hand. Good, you have the extra range. Then, if they're going for a nuker build, in most cases, they're going to be better off just having the, uh, the boulder shield, just taking the extra intelligence. Otherwise, if you want to have them uh, have the chance to parry, you give them the Kaldia, especially if they happen to, for example, have Concentration and a decent mind score, uh, then you can at least have a guaranteed 30% chance to go and charm something. So, you know, there's some... Now, I know 30% guaranteed might seem like a weird way to put it, but Concentration actually, and actually many of your buffs, will bottom out or cap out your uh, your minimum and maximum values in certain, certain circumstances. So, like, for example, Dodge... Like, say you had a 50% chance to dodge, it would boost that to 70%, but if you had a 0% chance to dodge, you would still get it up to uh, 20%. Um, it's kind of interesting as far as that goes. In fact, you can actually guarantee some really good dodge odds um, by, for example, putting, um, uh, like, maxing out the uh, the weather uh, using a uh, something like a, um, like a fall strike on somebody and then uh, using a dodge on a unit. Um, so, for example, I can already tell that is going to be a pretty big mainstay for challenge runs, but... Anyway, so, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, compare some stuff here. Now, for the sake of fair comparison, I'm actually gonna go ahead and take some stuff off of, uh, off of cash right here. But, uh, actually, you know what? Due to MP shenanigans, it probably won't make much of a difference. Because summon one and twos roughly do the same, uh, same amount of, uh, damage per hit. It's just a matter of how many hits they do. So, we're gonna go ahead and put all of the, kind of, mainline casters next to each other and see how much of a difference it truly makes between them. Over here in this corner, we have Mr. Evan the Patriarch, coming in with the amazing ability to simply ignore melee damage, ignore, well, ignore physical damage, ignore magical damage, have infinite MP, and shoot fire lizards at things, while also having a near guaranteed chance to poison with the poison fang, or the uh, dragon fang here. Um, now, it's especially funny because, yeah, this thing feels like it's got 80% uh, like capped odds or something for, uh, for poisoning with its stab. Meaning that while he doesn't necessarily do a whole lot of physical damage, uh, when you have a, uh, for example, AI-controlled um, uh, unit, and they want to go for a melee hit, uh, just having something with a chance to parry that also has a chance to poison is going to be pretty good. Now, all of this talk about casters and whatever else... Actually, let, let's finish uh, introducing everybody, okay? Next up over here, we have uh, Sherry, you know, Shaman doing the Shaman thing, um, with their usual Shaman type of casty stuff. Over here, we have Oleus uh, here as a witch, uh, doing the, uh, the lightning, as it were. Um, all of this is going to come down, by the way, in a hilarious fashion due to the fact that there no accurate uh, tests can actually be done, due to the fact that we probably will have, you know, one or more uh, opposing or, you know, weak elements, but whatever else. Um, 
or uh, over here, for example, we have the Valkyrie with her uh, with her Wisp Light 2s here, but also having the ability to both regenerate MP and also not use MP while using Nature's Touch at the same time. So that's kind of neat. Also, for example, if you collect a bunch of crit cards and you happen to have gear that boosts your luck by 30%, uh, she's actually... I've seen her on multiple occasions uh, landing crits without crit cards. It turns out there's actually a breakpoint somewhere in there that allows you to crit uh, without the ability to... Uh, uh, well, without the uh, the use of a crit card. It's, uh, it's a little unclear exactly how that works, but anyway, we're just going to go ahead and throw that out there. Okay, so... Uh, so we have all of that on there. Uh, so we have her as a hopefully crit build, but she's also invisible because stinky set. Um, and then over here we have Kashua as the Dark Priest uh, with the ability to absolutely unload on debuffs uh, and for, on anybody nearby. Where, for example, they're going to be doing roughly the same damage as everybody else. But if you happen to give them decent vitality equipment and also get them close, well, they can put stuff to sleep, they can put them to silence, they can curse them and poison them at the same time. But these things have a different meaning to how they, how they did last time. So poison is 30% health gone per turn. Like, as long as it can land, it can land on 95% of everything in this game, right? Almost nothing has poison proof. Uh, like, these auto abilities don't check resists. They just sort of happen. Uh, something like sleep is going to put that unit out of commission. Something like poison will wake them up and do a ton of damage. Honestly, it doesn't even matter that they overlap because this is hilarious. Um, something like silence will prevent them from casting, whereas something like curse, yes, it, re it reduces their maximum uh, HP and MP, but also, in the cases of something with high health, that's basically 300 plus health that's just gone from an auto move. Um, as well as the fact that it will continue losing more health over time. Um, especially with that poison damage going up once that curse wears off. So anyway, so there's all of that kind of thing coming out right there. Um, so they're solid in, in uh, the front line. You got something like the Patriarch that's uh, solid in the front line. Um, you got the Valkyrie that can just ignore lines whatsoever. And then you got the Neb who's just, you know, doing the big numbers with the friggin' casty stuff. Uh, do we have anything better for her? I feel like we picked up a Firestone 4. Who the hell has Firestone 4 at this point? I don't know. Whatever. We're gonna just send them out as they are, okay? And then all of them are gonna be comparing to a Lord that is completely not built for casting whatsoever. Now, I just wanna do this weird experiment here just to contextualize that when somebody says something is completely broken and it's done big numbers and whatever else, the context is all that necessarily mattered there. All of these things are way tighter balanced than they were before. Again, it feels a lot like Knight of Lotus to me, where a lot of this uh, damage and whatever else is very kind of rubber banded into place that you will get better numbers eventually, but realistically speaking, in most cases, it will just come down to whether or not you had an advantage for that particular turn against that particular unit. Um, so basically it comes down not to like, oh, I went and I built for this particular stat, it comes down more to, well, I, you know, I went and I just happened to make the right decision at the right time. Now, in this case, we're just going to get a better idea of how far their numbers can potentially uh, scale, because honestly, this fight's going to be absolutely nothing. This team, well, everybody on this team, at least everybody who survived so far, um, have been through so dang much at this point that it, honestly, any one of them could, reasonably speaking, not have a zero chance of just soloing this map by themselves. But, for example, let's compare the values of all these different things, right? So, among all of the units on this team, currently the one doing the least damage is going to be the generic archer with no training, uh, who is currently still learning bows, um, who is going to be uh, having the ability to guarantee a charm. Now, in most cases, they won't roll a meditate into an ease, so this basically means that uh, with every time that Eagle Eye triggers, which is again going to be about 70-80% of the time, when they fire, they will control that other unit. So, functionally speaking, their damage is not their damage. Their damage is whatever the damage is of the unit they hit. Meaning that that archer could essentially be seen as doing anything from just melee damage to summoner damage somewhere way off on the other end of the map. They don't need to do a lot of damage on, uh, on the upfront there because they're doing a lot of damage on the backfield. They're doing a lot of chaos. It's especially fun, again, to combine engulf into all of this, because then you you go and you fire and you hit a unit on the complete backside of their line there, right? Suddenly they're just going and they're attacking their own guys way off on the other end of the field. Healers are essentially getting redirected to the back line to go deal with that. Um, you've got uh, you've got frontliners that potentially are getting completely wasted and attacking their own guys. You're essentially causing a delay, causing chaos, causing a waste of resources, doing all this stuff at the same time. So, 
essentially a lot of parts of this of this, this game do come down to uh to overall like movement economy and whatever else and when you have these cases where you can have somebody doing way more jobs than simply you know throwing out the big number it's going to be a lot more useful for you like honestly most of the ai archers in this game you may notice their stats are more or less boosted because all they can do is damage if they ended up giving them all charm bows or something like that which by the way Please, One Vision Reborn, do that. Please give them debuff bows so people realize how to use them. I mean, I do agree on the fact that there was a misstep on the way that archers were handled, but not in terms of how they were balanced. In terms of how they are presented in the story. Um, that is to say, presented in all these fights, because they need to be doing more than just damage because it's not their strong point. They ended up boosting their dexterity so that they do more damage to your own guys. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, that's boring. Damage is boring. Being able to, for example, set up a situation where the debuffs literally can't even display on the screen and are scrolling by, that's the kind of stuff that I love this game for. Um, and uh, yeah, you can do that pretty consistently here. Like you may have noticed, my main guy here, uh, Mr. Denim over there, likes to run a Scorpion plus one uh, as well as Terrifying Impact. This basically means that uh, while the poison is guaranteed, he also gets fear on there, meaning that he can synergize very well with a lot of these kind of more DPS units there. So whenever he attacks, uh, he will usually end up, for example, triggering Phalanx. He will then uh, turn on Terrifying Impact, fly in, and then stab something uh, for both fear and poison, which will mean that the DPS units can then go in and finish off said unit. If anything's left, the poison will take care of it. Um, it basically is a nice one-size-fits-all option that ends up doing dramatically more DPS than any amount of summons. Um, which, yes, the summons can synergize into that, but, for example, a high-damage archer plus a you know, unit with fear and poison is going to do dramatically more faster. Um, but again, damage is just... it only matters if it actually does something. So, for example, a lot of times in the post-game, especially stuff like San Bronzo, which we'll show off here in just a moment, you'll see units coming in with full heals, coming in with all this stuff, so it doesn't matter how big and impressive your 1500 hit was if they come in and just can heal it off for, you know, 2000 immediately. Basically, disabling units, uh, turning them to your side, or being able to kill them outright is going to be more important than, you know, always having the bigger numbers. And as we see right here, the Valkyrie is essentially doing very similar numbers uh, when it comes to a lot of these other uh, other units here. So while, for example, uh, with a Magic Up and a Crit Plus, um, we saw something like Hashua throwing out 500s occasionally, by and large, she's usually doing about the 150 to 200 range, while the Valkyrie's doing about 100 to 150. This has been consistent pretty much through all of these post-game areas. Uh, it's, it's seemingly where they were locked in. It's seemingly where they're meant to be. And so the, I kept noticing this pretty much repeatedly, like just seeing these uh, these situations where all of these casters for all of the fluff back and forth over who's the best and whatever else they all are doing similar numbers it's just a matter of what they have available to them at any given time and especially considering many of the complaints I saw towards other casters a lot of those same folks ended up preferring the shaman complaining about RNG when that is the most RNG heavy caster in the game <laughs> You see some some funny discrepancies as far as all that stuff is concerned. Uh, anyway, but uh, anyway, I, point being, I, I, f I think that there's a better argument to be made for any one of these particular casters. Like, for example, right here, you might notice, again, similar damage coming out of uh, Denim over here, but why the hell is that? Well, because he had a big elemental advantage there. Uh, whereas, for example, uh, somebody like uh, Evan over here, I would assume picked up a card at some point that he was doing that much damage. We'll take a take a quick look right here and go ahead and compare. And no, he actually did not. So, go figure. Um, but uh, actually, wait a minute. I wonder if that unit was an ice, not a uh, water. I don't know. Point being, point being, all these numbers are going to be very different in a lot of different circumstances. Uh, with in the case of Denim here, he's been a fencer all the way from uh, like level three all the way to fifty. So, as far as his overall numbers go, uh, he's. I mean, like, I've never put intelligence cards on, or I've never put intelligence charms on him or whatever else. He's just kind of built up as he's naturally built up. But, anyway. Okay, so. Let's, uh, let's see what she ends up doing. There we go, just a bunch of 240s. Again, pretty much exactly the same as the Patriarch, as you kind of expect at this point. 
overall, a lot of this stuff is the same general, like, overall ranges. It's, uh, it's, again, nothing to, uh, to really argue about in terms of, uh, in terms of their DPS. The argument really should be made more towards, uh, towards what other options they have available. So as far as I'm concerned, the Patriarch is probably going to be the best one there, but we're going to be doing a tier list of all this stuff in, um, in just a little bit here, I think. Uh, we're just going to let them uh, finish off this Mr. Uh, pumpkin head over here, and then we'll go ahead and move on from there. As we see, we got uh, the same summons. Again, tier 1s and 2s, basically the same damage. I'm The reason that I have to keep repeating this every time, by the way, is uh, it tends to get forgotten between times that it's said. I'm sorry to be annoying on that one. This, this comes up a lot in comments. Um, and granted, I might just be seeing the ones that happen to land at the top there. It, that's entirely possible. Anyway, so, let's go ahead and show what San Bronzo looks like. Because, like, Palace of the Dead, this is basically your endgame grind spot. You get towards the end of these fights, and they're like, here you go, here, have, have all this random loot, have all these charms, have all this other stuff. Uh, by the time you're doing late Palace of the Dead, you're looking at situations where you're just, like, farting out, uh, you know, five, six charms per fight. That kind of thing. Uh, which, actually, a funny thing to note, um, on, I believe the earliest is floor 39, but you got a bunch of these, like, special occasion boss fights uh, that, uh, that you can do. Uh, so, for example, while the uh, initial thought might be, well, I have to go and grind out uh, stuff like uh, San Bronza to go get your Daedalus Racks and Pinions and Oricalcums and whatever else, which Oricalcums basically free in this version, um, but instead of going and... Um, and, and actually grinding out all of those things, uh, you can actually uh, apparently kill those bosses for two forks each, which is a little bit hilarious. Anyway, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, deploy these guys on AI, see how they do, because realistically, after you've passed through, through any particular map once, in most cases, uh, you can actually just go back and turn it on AI, and uh, as long as everybody can fly or has steadfast, the AI is smart enough to, generally speaking, keep itself alive, as long as you don't have anybody that is a massive flaw in the party. <clears throat> Shamans. Um, so, you know, there's that. But, anyway. But again, that's personal experience. Like, there's certain circumstances where if somebody stacks enough intelligence, and they can get to that kind of uh, critical mass point, they can potentially uh, get to that point where they can... Oh, sorry, man winter stuff is a bit annoying this year. Um, for example, if they're exploiting weaknesses and they get to that point of having enough intelligence in mind that they're able to fully overwhelm something, then yes, you do eventually get to that critical mass point where a few, uh, you know, a few shamans might be able to fill the role of the old archers. But, you know, same thing as before, you could literally say the same about any other caster uh, that happens to have engulf and meditate on them at the same time because they all basically do the same damage. Um, it takes a lot of points to make any kind of difference. So there's that. Um, now then, um, another weird argument, by the way, uh, just to throw this out there. Um, in terms of endgame archers, like, what exactly is their role if technically the same, uh, the same kind of uh, damage can be seen from casters? Now, I partially already covered this with, like, a guaranteed uh, charm coming out on, like, Cupid Bows. And a lot of the endgame bows having a lot of scaling to the point that if you have any way to, you know, get them past defense or you get their stats high enough that they just get past defense, they're going to do pretty much the same damage that they did in PSP in a lot of cases. Um, basically, uh, basically, it just kind of comes down to availability. Um, in a lot of cases, like, mages end up being your far less than subtle option. Uh, whereas archers are usually pretty good at uh, picking off particular things. Now, granted, this is going to be situational. But, for example, say you're having a problem with griffins or cockatrices, archers hard counter them. Uh, because they're one of very few things that's able to leaden, and they're able to leaden at long range. Um, say, for example, you have... Like, I, I used the example earlier of the, uh, the backline charm. If you have uh, something like a flaming blast, and, for example, you build for a tanky archer... Um, and, uh, like, let's say you, uh, you go and you throw them, kind of, uh, throw them ahead and attack the back line, then potentially, you know, you might have something interesting coming out of that. In fact, uh, Glenda over there, my, uh, generic archer, uh, that I've had from the beginning of the game, um, their build that I'm gonna be switching to in a moment here is essentially going to be a, uh, short bow build. Uh, essentially making use of the, uh, the thunder bow at this point, uh, to... Uh, to use a, to make a, a sort of skirmisher type situation. Now, surprisingly, this has actually stayed like pretty decent uh, into the end game here. Um, I had a running uh, Damask uh, shortbow and Damask dagger uh, in through San Bronza, 
she was still doing a good job just stunning things. So you never know, um, you never know. Like, a, a lot of this stuff, again, just comes down to context. Uh, for example, stuff like Canopus, consistently he will do about three, 400 with each one of his swords as a buccaneer, which is fine and well and good and great, and he's a pretty solid frontliner. Um, at the same time, you know, he can potentially get double parried by a lot of units, which seems to happen distressingly often in San Bronza, and I'm not really sure why. Um, I don't know if everything here is just crazy lucky or what, but on more than one occasion, I just ended up not bringing Canopus along anymore. Like, I, I want to say past, uh, like, Floating Ruins 8 or so, I just stopped bringing him along for quite a, quite a portion there. Because it was like, you know what, unless he's, uh, unless I uh, get another uh, warrior in here, um, which the warrior on my team died recently, so, you know, she, get, she got blasted off a cliff. It was unfortunate. Um, actually, I can definitely confirm that the AI, with absolute certainty, uh, targets units nearby cliffs with missile spells, because they seem to target them, again, distressingly often. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, they died, so didn't have a vigorous uh, user anymore, which suddenly meant that uh, he did not have his guarantee, which suddenly meant that, uh, yeah, he could get double parried with relatively little effort, and it was honestly just, again, a bit worrying how often that happened. I don't really know why. All right, so, yeah, ultimately we can just kind of come down to the fact that, yes, archers are, you know, are good and situational, Mages are pretty much all going to be the same, doing the same kind of damage, so realistically, please attempt to consider something other than shamans, because they are the squishiest of the bunch, and the tiny bit of extra damage they do is simply not worth it. Um, in fact, it's been, okay, weirdly fun build here. Um, I, I made this weird Deneb build as a, uh, as a bit of a meme, because, you know, haha, -ha, kinky witch and all of that kind of thing, but like... She's actually been really good, <laughs> is the thing. Um, and it's not even a stats thing. It's not even a magic time thing. Honestly, Spellcraft has been a bit of a bummer. I don't feel like Spellcraft has been doing nearly as much as it used to. But, like, when, when it comes to Deneb there, the whole, like, frontline witch with a whip thing, she's pretty squishy, so she gets targeted a lot. So she ends up getting a lot of counters with a whip. So she ends up getting quite a few attacks off. Armageddon does a absolute shitload of damage while being non-elemental. I mean, all things considered, a lot of uh, heavy uh, two-hander finishers are going to be running the 5-600 range at this point. Um, whereas, for example, she can do that consistently against even bosses for some reason. Um, so, yeah, Armageddon is just very consistently uh, high damage there. Um, and also just, like, I don't know, just generally speaking, her countering stuff has been surprisingly solid damage overall. Um big number go swoosh. Um, did he actually pick up a crit card, or was that a natural crit? Because I'm trying to show off at least one natural crit here. Yeah, so that was a natural crit. Um, actually, can we confirm that it says natural crit? Did it actually... Or was that just... I don't know. It, it might have just been a these guys suck crit. I don't know. It, it, was, it was a hell of a lot of damage, way more than he usually does, so I'm gonna assume it was a natural crit. Anyway... Um, you can get natural crits, they're just exceedingly rare, is the thing. Okay, so this has gone into a bit of a ramble here. Realistically, again, the main point I just wanted to make is that, uh, can, everything can matter differently contextually. Like, for example, for a lot of San Bronza, I even had Denim running around with no skill on the spears, he still hit 100% of the time. Uh, terrifying Impact plus Poison ends up doing like, the same damage as Summons do anyway, and more in a lot of cases. Oy. <clears throat> Alright, thank you, Throat Freaking Out. Much appreciated there. Anyway, so for example, even something as basic as Poison, which I'm talking about Weapon Poison, not specifically... Uh, and not specifically caster poison, like 30% uh, chance to hit off of uh, concentrate is good, at least good enough uh, for a lot of cases. Like I, I had a um, an enchantress that I've been using for well, pretty much all of the post game now, who was able to do comparable damage just using concentrate and uh, poison cloud, you know, compared to all of these uh, fancy casters and whatever else. But there's really no reason not to do all of them at once. Basically, initially go, you know, poison and fear everything. Just spread debuffs like an absolute crazy person. You know, poison, fear, stun. Most things are able to be affected by most of these. Breach if you got it. Um, realistically, 
attack values on weapons matter a lot less than debuffs this time around. Um, I was I wasn't exactly sure about saying that before, you know, because a lot of folks uh, come here for advice on different things. But yes, I, I can safely say that in most cases, unless you've got somebody, you know, that's having a hard time versus armor specifically, in most cases, any secondary effects on weapons are going to matter a decent bit more um, than any amount of um, attack value on the thing. But like again, the scorpion is a uh, it is a freaking chapter two weapon, or maybe even it might be early chapter three. I forget at this point. Um, but still, it's a like it's a back in the story weapon. We are at the very end of post game, and that thing is still able to threaten stuff in Coda Four. For reference, stuff in Coda Four, like you are capped out at level fifty, but you can keep gaining stats through uh, through charms and cards and whatever else. Stuff in Coda Four uh, starts off at level seventy one. Um, you are very quickly. Oh, and by the way, that's actually the the uh, the least important part. Let me show you what what I mean. I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, save that real quick, because realistically, I was coming here for something completely different. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and withdraw here real quick, and we're gonna go down to Coda Four real quick, because all of this stuff was just set up for Coda Four. Just head down there just to show you what Coda Four even looks like. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to the Warden Report. We're gonna I'm gonna read about the talk of the day, because I had to warp back and acquire more peoples. So let's go to the talk of the day, and they talk about the monument. There's a monument to the peace. I would like the pizza, so we go there. And then suddenly stories occur, and people are all like, ha ha. Do you remember how we had a past, and how there was an intro, and whatever else? And then you do the time warp, and you go back in time! to do time shenanigans, and then you go back to the SNES art, which is pretty cool. Anyway, um, yep, did, yep, did, yep, did, yep, and then we're going to leave it on AI just to show you how quickly they get their uh, hineys whooped, as you do, as you do. So anyway, there's story here. So... There we go, we're just gonna go ahead and start off at 70. Um, what's funny is that uh, all of these uh, civilians that you're supposed to be protecting here are also at 70. I believe it is actually a, uh, a failure if you uh, if you let all of them die. Uh, anyway, yeah, chapter four is very dramatic, I gotta say. Now, I, I wanna point out what matters is not your DPS at this point, okay? This is all on AI just kind of because, and again, you know, friggin' cheap as hell weapon from way back when, and he's still able to do 260 to this guy 20 levels higher than him. What actually matters is how hard you can break the game by this point, okay? Like, these guys, again, have been collecting stats for ages, right? They've been collecting stats, they've been upgrading their gear, they've been getting all this different stuff, um, and everything will have its heyday at a different portion of the game, okay? Everything will be good at different times. Something like, for example, uh, ninjas and ninja summons are fantastic in around chapter 2, but end up dropping off pretty hard uh, later on in the game. But, for example, something else, like, let's say, summoners might be really good in chapter 4, but they end up, uh, well, they remain pretty well consistent, but they end up potentially feeling a bit uh, iffy next to some of the other units they end up running into. It all is just a matter of how much love you're going to put into those particular units. Now, you might notice something here, that these guys are all, almost all running, like, relic gear and whatever else, including weapons I haven't even found yet. Um, you know, so that's, that's a bit of a thing. <laughs> Some of them are literally running god weapons and things, so all of the crazy, you know, post-game stuff from before got taken up to 11 uh, for the, uh, the post-game chapters. And you might notice, again, stuff that's generally considered useless is still showing up here just fine. Even against these units, uh, the archers are still doing damage at pretty long range, because I've got a damage archer, I've got a debuff archer. It's just a matter of what you want to use. Whatever build you make, if you're consistent with it, you will find a way to make it work. The only thing overpowered is your own brain. That's that's more or less what it comes down to. Ultimately, there's enough rubber banding and whatever else to make practically anything viable. Um, and if something's viable, it can also be tilted up. You just gotta twist the knobs a little bit until it becomes overpowered. That has That is and always has been the absolute beauty of these games that everything can be made overpowered. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, like, for example, uh, back in uh, March of the Black Queen, one of the worst units that you could get was a fairy. 
But, for example, uh, if you were to uh, do something along the lines of, uh, let's say, you, you find um, you find a item uh, that says that it, you find a voucher for a shop, and it's got a stat shop, and it lets you buy as much intelligence as you want, and then you just buy all that intelligence and you put it on a fairy, suddenly you have one fairy that's able to steamroll entire armies with frickin' lasers. It's... Again, it's just always been a thing in this series. Breaking it has been half the fun. So, it, no, it's not the class that's overpowered. It's the work that you put into it that is overpowered. It's the effort that you put in to make it work that is overpowered. Um, but yeah, same can be said for absolutely anything. Most of these guys are not exactly prepared for this end game right now. Uh, I was still going and building up this team in order to, um, uh, to actually... Uh, try to go for the uh, the ambition and all of that kind of thing uh, for those that didn't know uh, if you uh, if you if you do all of this uh, chapter four bit right you can actually uh, uh, take uh, Tartarus a sword um, and yeah th this is like basically all of uh, chapter four is just a uh, bizarre time warp type situation and yes the charm bow even works on these guys and when they're throwing out 900s it's a bit more useful uh, around this stage of the game is the thing. Um, no, what's this guy gonna do? Has he found an ice unit? No, he's found a wind... Well, eh, he's found a wind unit. At least he's neutral against that. But as you can see, again, Patriarch, once again, throwing off two-thirds of something's health. Melee guy, once again, throwing off two-thirds of something's health. The fairy, not nearly as impressive as all that, but they're able to potentially charm, like, seven units at once. So, you know, there's a lot of... It depends in absolutely everything. What a shocker. I know. Every one of these videos basically comes down to, hey, guess what? It depends. It's almost like all of this was, I don't know, made in a way that is both balanced and extraordinarily unbalanced at the exact same time. How the hell does that even work? Yeah, welcome to the Ogre Games. What can I say? Anyway, so there we go. She's also, once again, doing that whole thing of taking off most of something's health. It's almost like all of these things are very rubber banded or something. Um, anyway. So, hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully this was another amusing, incoherent ramble. And um, next up, I think we'll go ahead and start talking about... Oh, that's adorable! We charmed the guy, and he decided to go give his Gatorade to the locals. Ah, we made him into a good guy. Isn't that nice? The serial killer became a non-murderer for a second because he gave a peaceful unit some Gatorade, but then he was given some Gatorade of his own. Anyway, whatever. So, point being, let's do more stuff in a moment. But, uh, yeah, y'all have a good one. Take care. Bye.